That is what this chapter is about, chapter 19, electric potential and electric field. Even before we start, I want to tell you there is a big difference between these two. Electric field, we've heard about that, is a vector. Now, a vector has both magnitude and direction. So electric field has a direction. So it has a size and a direction. But electric potential is, OK, what's the opposite of a vector? A scalar. So this, when you, whenever you see potential, it has nothing to do with direction. OK? So it's easier to play around with potential because it has nothing to do with direction. It's like time. Somebody asks you, what's the time? You wouldn't say 12.20 to the west. Would you? No. So something like that. In fact, if you understand this concept, just this one slide, this chapter will become so easy. And that's assuming that you know what gravitational force is. Do you? This object has a weight because of the gravitational force pulling it down. Clear? But when it's on a table, it has potential energy. Everybody knows that? Yes. Now, if I lift this object, am I doing work? Yes. Okay, good. What happens to its potential energy? Use the word increase or decrease, but don't please say crease, okay? Yeah. <laughs> what happens to its potential energy? Definitely, its potential energy has increased, which means I did work. So for me, if I did 10 joules of work, oh, joule is the unit of work. So if I did 10 joules of work, then the potential energy of this increased by 10 joules. Because energy can neither be created nor destroyed. I had to do 10 joules. So I lost 10 joules. This object gained 10 joules. Is that clear? So work is the negative of the change in potential energy. Work is the negative of the change. Oh, if you put a little triangle, that stands for change. Okay? Work is negative. Did you understand the negative? I tried. Because I said my energy decreased and the energy of this increased. So look at this diagram. As this ball rolls down a hill, its potential energy is changing into kinetic energy. Isn't that what's written here? Change in potential energy is equal to change in kinetic. So if the potential energy goes down by 20 joules, the kinetic energy goes up by 20 joules. The same exact idea. So that is in a gravitational field. Now let's talk about an electric field. Now these are two metal plates kept parallel to each other. One is positively charged, the other is negative. What do these lines represent? Thank you. The electric field. The electric field is always from positive to... Hey, we had a quiz question. It starts from a positive charge and ends on a... Do you see that? So, now, if you imagine that there is a positively charged object here, what direction would it automatically go in? Towards... Just like if I hold an object here, what direction would it automatically go in? Do you get it? Because the gravitational field is downwards. So in the same way, this would automatically go from the positive to the negative because it's a? All right? And so the same thing happens here. The change in the electric potential energy is equal to the change in the kinetic energy. See, there's no difference between these two, except that this is gravitational and this is electric. Is that clear? Let me see if it's clear. What if this positive charge was here on this plate? All right? Will it go automatically to the opposite plate? If it's a positive, what would you have to do? 
work. So you would have to do work to take a positive charge from the negative plate to the positive plate. Are you getting it? So whatever work you do will be equal to the negative of the change in potential energy, just like lifting an object. So I've given you two examples. Uh, because we all know what a battery is, but we do not know how it works. But inside the battery, there are chemical reactions taking place. And as you can see in this diagram, electrons, that's the negative charge. Do you see that? Electrons obviously go from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. Do you see that? Electrons go from negative to positive. Duh. And if there is a light bulb there, because the electrons go through the light bulb, the light bulb lights up. So where is that light energy coming from? Of course, it's coming from the battery. The chemical energy inside the battery is being changed into light energy. Do you see that? But if it's a speaker, then the chemical energy is being changed into sound, different forms. If it's a heater, it's being changed into heat. So in every case, you need to have a chemical energy here. But what's interesting is, see that it goes from here. What, what goes? What goes? Electrons, negative charges go from the negative to the positive. But once it gets into the battery, ions move. Do you know what ions are? You have both positive and negative. And so inside the battery, electric current is due to the movement of ions. But outside, it's due to the movement of electrons. I thought you should have written that. You don't know how, you know, what to write, you know, unless I tell you, so I have to tell you. Inside the battery, there is movement of what? Movement of ions. What ions? Both positive and negative. Of course, moving in opposite directions, OK? So inside the battery, the ions move in opposite directions. But outside, well, what moves outside? Only electrons. Remember, protons never move, OK? And there's also another thing that I want you to write down, and this is easy to remember, but it's very important. The positive terminal is at a higher potential. Positive, higher. Negative, lower. Can you remember that? Positive is at a higher potential, and negative is at a lower potential. Always. Mm -hmm. We did, didn't we? So between these two plates, you have an electric field, and electric field is always from positive to negative, correct? Mm -hmm. And this is an electron, so it will by itself move in the opposite direction. Oh, the electron moves opposite of the field. True or false? True. True. Electrons always move opposite to the field. And as it moves, it will pick up kinetic energy. What's the formula for kinetic energy? Very good. One half times mass times velocity squared. And there is an easy equation to find out what the kinetic energy of this electron would be. Easy. If the voltage between these two plates the voltage between these two plates is 10 volt. Okay, between these two is 10. I want you to be listening. Which would mean this is at plus 5 and this is at minus 5. Is that correct? What's the difference between plus 5 and minus 5? Okay, very good. Number line, plus 5. Uh oh. Minus 5. What's the difference between plus 5 and minus 5? What's the difference? Is it 0? If, it, if you say 0, that means I'm at the same point. That drives me crazy. What's the difference between plus 5 and minus 5? It's 10. Now, you can see that labeling it that way is confusing. So what we have decided to do is this. The negative potential is always taken as 0. So the negative potential 
usually is the ground, will always be assumed to be zero. So if that's zero, how much should this be? Makes that easier, correct? So that's what we'll be using. So whenever we say negative potential, it would mean the ground, and it should be at that is just to make it easy for us. Actually, it was negative five. Are you with me? But to make it easy for us, we would just assume it's zero. So we know if the potential difference is 10 volt, then this is zero, that's 10. Got it? And now, what's the kinetic energy? The kinetic energy is one half this. Easy. It's just equal to the charge of the electron times what was the voltage? Okay. I'll give you an equation. So to find the kinetic energy of an electron, that's the formula for kinetic energy. All you have to do is multiply the charge of the electron with the voltage, voltage or potential difference. Do you see that I'm using two words? I'm interchanging. I'm saying two words. What are the two words? Voltage, voltage or potential difference. I'm going to define it soon in the next slide, but wait. So this formula is does that make sense? Yeah. What's M? Mass of whatever is moving. In this case, it's an electron. Dangerous. What is this? And what is this? You better know how to write the little one and the big one. I've seen people cancel that out because they're not paying attention. So what I would suggest is this is what I do. I just put a ribbon on top of this. or like, eh, that's me, crazy. So because it's important. Sometimes it's tough to distinguish between these two fibers. Okay. You do what you like. But please don't cancel them out because this is velocity and this is voltage. And what's Q? Electron. Charge of the electron. All right. So I want you to work out a problem. I think I should mix problems. In. Electron volt is a new unit of energy. But what is one electron volt? That number is right. But one electron volt is the kinetic energy of an electron accelerated through a potential difference of one volt. So if you accelerate it through two volts, its kinetic energy would be two electron volts. If you accelerate it through 100 volts, it would be 100 electron volts. Isn't that easy? So one electron volt is the same as 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Yes, you have to write that. You have to write that. Now, that's exactly what's coming up there. Kinetic energy is charge times the voltage. But I just wanted to go a little ahead of this. Can you find the velocity of this electron, the speed of this electron? Go ahead. You have two plates with one positive, the other negative. What's the direction of the electric field? positive to negative, and electric field is represented by the letter E. So that makes it very clear. And remember that I told you the kinetic energy or the work could be simply given by the charge of the electron multiplied by the potential difference between A and B. Is that clear? Didn't we talk about that? Work or kinetic energy. Maybe there you thought it's only kinetic energy, but remember, work and kinetic energy are always equal. So, work is charge times potential difference. So, you know what that, that is? V sub AB means potential difference between the plates A and B. So, this is A, this is B, all right? Now, this is a new formula, which is very important. It gives you the relation between electric field, E, and the potential difference. 
What is this little d? It's the distance between the plates. So that's a formula. And from that formula, can you give me a new unit for electric field? You're so fast. Amazing. Thank you. From this one, and some didn't even hear, because they need to be, hear everything twice. Well, that's why I say it three times. All right. What's the unit of this? What's the unit of potential difference? Volt. Volt. What's the unit of distance? Meter. Meter. So the unit of electric intensity could also be volt over meter. Wait, yesterday we learned uh, its unit. What was the unit of electric intensity? Newtons per coulomb. Don't forget yesterday is why we come today. So there are two units for electric intensity. What are they? Newtons per coulomb or volt per meter because of the two formulas. All right. Yesterday's unit came from the formula E is equal to F by Q. You remember that? Today we have the formula E is equal to voltage by distance. That's all I'm saying. So if you bring the plates closer, what happens to the electric field? It gets bigger because the denominator becomes smaller, the value becomes bigger, right? So understand that. If you have two metal plates and you bring them closer, the field is going to get bigger. Now think about the size of the cell. Big or small? Size of a cell in your body. And so it's like two metal plates very close to each other. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So if, if you even set up a small potential difference, like the potassium on one side, you see? Come on. And the sodium on the other side or whatever. So that sets up a potential difference, which may be small. But because the distance between them is so, so small, the electric field inside is really powerful. Did you understand? So I hate when people say I have no energy in me. You don't know how much energy you have in you. Each cell in your body has such a lot of electric field strength. It's only your brain that's cheating you and telling you that you have no energy. Tell the brain to get out and move on. That's the only way. And uh, in the radiograph generator, I'm not going to describe its complete functioning, but you will be seeing this in the lab, and you will touch it, play with it when time permits, but I just want to tell you something. There is a motor here, and there is a pulley, as you can see. You see that? And as the motor rotates, this, uh, this part of the rotor rotates, and there is another insulating pulley. Means, uh, I mean a belt. A belt made of an insulating material, like rubber, which will be continuously moving here because the motor is spinning. And then some of the parts are not shown here, but just to understand that due to friction, it gets charged. And as the part of the belt reaches here, it gives its charge to the sphere. You see a sphere surrounding it, a metal sphere? Is the, is the belt touching the sphere, actually? No, it's not. But how come it's able to charge the sphere, then, if it's not touching? What is that process of charging called? <laughs> Correct. So. If the belt has positive charge, let's assume, the sphere is going to get what charge? Negative. Negative charge. And since this process is continuing to happen, you will see that after some time, the aluminum sphere picks up a lot of charge, continuously builds up charge. And if you keep doing that, after some time, you hear, you see a spark. What's happened? I told you yesterday, air becomes a conductor, and all the charge on the aluminum sphere has just been discharged. But if you don't do that, and before that, if you go and touch it, you will get a shock because you're grounding it. So the discharge takes place through you. But what is interesting here is, I want to give you a situation where you know, we had thunderstorms last week, didn't we? Lightning and thunderstorms and all that. So if you are in a thunderstorm and uh, you, get, you have three opportunities, you could stand under a tree you could uh, lie under your blanket in your bedroom at home, or you could sit in your car 
whose tires were stolen the previous night. It's lost all the four tires. It's, a, it's sitting on the driveway. So you have three chances. Either during the lightning, you could stand under a tree, sleep under the blanket in your home, or sit in that car with no tires. What would you do? Assuming that you want to survive, OK? What would you do? At least at this point, people should uh, you know, participate. Blanket is the obvious answer, but you are in danger. The worst is to be under the tree. Everybody knows that. But the best place is to be in your car. I'll explain. That's why I set it up that way. And then you know why I had to have the thieves remove the tires? Because otherwise, you would think the tires are insulating. You see that? So I just wanted you to know that that doesn't matter. The metal body of the car is now on the driveway. It doesn't matter because there can be no electric field inside a charged metal sphere. I'll say it one more time. If you charge a sphere like this one, you're charging it, aren't you? The charges will be on the outside, number one. And number two, inside, the electric field will be how much? So, two important things. Number one, charges always stay on the outside of a metal sphere. OK? Charges always stay or reside on the outside of a sphere. And two, what's the second point I told you? Very important. The electric field. Inside a charged metal sphere is always zero. zero, non-existent, no field. What you see is a point charge. It's a positive charge. And I think you know what these blue arrows stand for. Does anybody know? The electric field. Correct? All right. Now stay with me. If I take this point, you see where I'm pointing? And I calculate the potential at that point, not the field, the potential at that point. <coughs> and I take this point. You see that the distances from the charge are equal at this point and this one, they are equal. What can you say about the electric potential at these two points? Surely they're equal. Will that apply to every other point that is at the same distance? Yes. yes. So if I join all the points around that charge, what will I get? What geometrical figure will I get? Sorry, I'll get a sphere. Well, that's two-dimensional. That's why you see a circle. But when you have a positive charge, it's going to be here. Come on now. And so wouldn't I get a sphere? Now, that surface where the potential is equal is called an equipotential surface. Should make sense? Where did the word come from? Equal potential. OK, so what does that mean? So is this another equipotential surface? Yeah. Yes. What about the next one? Oh, does that mean that the potential on the inner one is the same as on the second one, is the same as on the third one? Is that what I'm saying? No, no, no. no. I'm trying to say that the potential on one surface is the same. That's what I'm trying to say. OK? You with me? Next question. If you are listening, next question. How much work should I do to move another charge? Uh, not this one. Imagine I have another charge here, OK? How much work should I do to move another charge from here till here? Or how much work should I do to move another charge from one point on the equipotential surface to another point on the same equipotential surface? I want the answer. How much work should I do? How, what is the difference in potential between two points on the equipotential surface? You almost uh, <laughs> gave me the answer. So that's very important, to move a charge 
from one point on an EQ potential surface to another point on the same EQ potential surface, how much work has to be done? Zero. Right. No work needs to be done. Now, I told you that these notes are just the outline. You'll have to write in between and more than that if you're listening. Believe me, I'm not going fast. I'm giving you enough chances to understand and to write. And the third point is, uh, tell me the angle between the electric line, that means the field lines, see, and the equipotential surface. What is the angle between, for example, this line and this surface? Right there, what's the angle? Is that true for every equipotential surface and the electric field? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So that's the third and very important point. And that's, I think, in your notes, there is a sentence to that effect. Maybe you'd like to fill in the blank or something. All right. Equipotential surfaces make an angle of 90 degrees with the electric field. All right. This is how it's given. Equipotential lines are those that join points at the same electric potential. That's in your notes. And EQ potential lines are always, what does it say? Perpendicular. Perpendicular to the electric field lines. Very important. And although it's not in your notes, I just want to dig a little deeper. Look, you know why these lines are drawn like this? You see the EQ potential surfaces, are they equally spaced? No. All right, let me give some values to, I forgot to pick that up. Okay. If I give a value of potential, like let's say it's uh, 10 here, 20 here, 30 here, what do you understand? So the difference between the potential of these surfaces are the same, like 10, 20, 30, but the distance is increasing or decreasing as you go out? Increasing. Can somebody tell me why? What's happening to the field? As you go out, what's happening to the strength of the field as you go out? Weakening. Weakening, decreasing. And you remember this formula? E is equal to? So if this has to decrease, surely this has to? How many understood? Let me see your hands. Thank you. So if you have any questions on that, please. Well, you can see this. This is just, uh, what's this called? It's called an electric dipole. I think I mentioned that, right? This is one positive, the other negative. Yeah. And again, once again, you have the blue arrows showing the electric field, correct? Obviously, going away from the positive, coming towards the negative. And then, what are these green ones? They are the equipotential surfaces in this case. Once again, you see that the distance is, you see it changes. <coughs> look at this point. And then look at here. Hasn't it changed? So for those who are listening, point one or point two, where is the field bigger? Point one, I'm talking about the electric field now. Point one, point two. I'm talking about the electric field. There are two things, potential and field. I'm talking about the field. I told you the field is stronger where the equipotential surfaces are closer. I just told you. I just told you. Let me tell you again, you know, because you seem to be missing it. The field is stronger where the equipotential surfaces are closer. Yeah. So surely the field is stronger here. Then here, it's obvious because on this side, it's only the negative charge that has an effect, right? But on this side, don't both have an effect? That's why.
What's the difference between this one and the last one? Look at the charges. They're both the same. And once again, you see the pattern changing, and we have done this for the electric lines. Don't you know that they will repel? The electric lines will repel? So on the exam, I could ask you to sketch something like this. You should be able to do it. Whether I ask you or not, you should be able to do it. You know, you should get that difference. And, and oh, look at this. This one, oh, this is interesting. What's the potential here? Negative 10. What's the potential here? Is it increasing or decreasing as you go away? Increasing. increasing. Negative 10. Negative 5 is bigger than negative 10. And when, if you keep going away, here's the deal. If you keep going away, the further you go, the negative number should become like negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. And when you reach infinity, wherever that is, that's when it will become so what's the electric potential assumed to be at infinity? That's another point. It tell you that actually the potential of a negatively charged plate is negative, and the potential of a positively charged plate is positive. So we could have labeled them as negative 50 volts and positive 50. That's confusing. You remember I told you? So what do we assume? We just assume that the negative is at and obviously it's grounded. I told you even that. So negative is taken to be zero and grounded. So that's why you have zero and 100, which is the same as having negative 50 and positive 50, isn't it? The difference is the same. Are you with me? Yes. All right. OK, thank you. And wait, now that it's open, what do the green lines show? I don't know. What do the blue lines show? Electric field. Electric field. The electric field, if you have parallel lines at equal distances, like there, that means the field is constant. That means the electric field is the same, you see, except at the edges. You see what happened at the edges? Forget those parts. Just otherwise, do you see that the lines are shown with the same distance, electric field lines? Whenever you see electric field lines that are like parallel and at equal distances, what does that show? constant field. If they are closer, the field is stronger. If the electric lines are closer, it's stronger. Same distance, constant. And uh, what are the green lines? Equipotential. Are they still perpendicular to the field lines? Yes. Okay. So capacitors are, are used to store charges. Like a water tank stores water, you see that? But now, my question is, if you have a sphere, like if you have a metal sphere, can't it store charges? No. Hey, we did this lab yesterday. You saw that uh, if you, after rubbing them together, if you held it for a long time, like five minutes, and then test it, what would you get? Zero. Why? Air molecules are carrying it away, so it's leaking away. Charges leak away. Charges leak away. So if you had a sphere and you had it like positively charged in the morning, by the time you come in the evening, you have nothing left on it. That's one problem. The second problem is if, if you keep on adding charges, what's going to happen? I did tell you even that. What's going to happen? It's going to discharge because the air becomes conducting. You see, so we have two problems. So scientists had a problem with that. They said, man, how do we keep the charge there? We don't want it to leak away. And we want to build it to a big number. You know, we don't. So that's why they said, what do we do? Well, the example is funny, but it's true. How do you keep a man quiet? Give him a woman. Otherwise, he'll run around and create havoc. Don't quote me on this. He'll destroy many others. That is the idea of marriage whether you like it or not, and I'm recording it. Okay. When you have two plates, and you, you say you, keep the, you make this positive. Are you listening to me closely now? This is the most important part. And this other plate is so, so close to it. It's not this far away. It's really close. What's going to happen? If you give this a positive charge, what's going to happen immediately? 
This becomes what? All right, they are married to each other now. They hold each other in place. Can't you understand this little thing? Because they attract each other and they're like, okay, you don't go anywhere because I'm here. <laughs> but now there is another problem. The problem is that, isn't there a check? Wait, what, when do you say that something is positively charged? When it has lost electrons. When do you say something is negatively charged? So this positive charged plate actually needs electrons. And this plate has excess electrons. And you have them really close to each other. Can you see that? So what may happen? The excess electrons from here, can they just move over? Now, they don't want that to happen. You know what we do? We have an insulator between the two. Now, that insulator is called a dielectric. And the reason is, now, come on. So between the two metal plates that are very close, you have a thin insulating material, like mica or paraffin paper or whatever. You have it there. What's going to happen? Look, you got, got to be careful. In an insulator, you cannot move charges. You can only separate them. Just a little bit. How much should I say? Let me, let me try to... I really want you to understand. Look, in an insulator or in any material, this is the nucleus, the electrons are going around it, correct? I want your total attention now because that will become tough. So, the center of the positive charge is here. It's the center of the nucleus. Why? Because the positive charges are the protons that are right there. Where is the center of all the negative electrons? It's also there. So they totally, completely cancel out. Did you understand? Their centers, the center of the positive charge is at the center of the nucleus. And since the electrons are going around the nucleus, the center of those Negative electrons are also at the center of the nucleus. So they're like, just like center of gravity. You know what center of gravity is? Where you can balance an object? Same way. Now, that's the usual case. But in this insulator, because there are charges on this side, positive, this side, positive, you know what's going to happen? There is going to be a slight shift in their centers. So. The, positive the center of the positive charge will shift a little bit in this direction. You know why? Because this plate is negative, and the center of the negative charges will move a little bit in that direction. Are you getting what I'm saying? So instead of being exactly there, it'll go. Now that's called polarization. It's called electric polarization. So the dielectric becomes polarized. Let me draw that for you. So you have negative and positive, negative and positive, negative and positive. How many understood that? What I drew just now. I'm showing the centers of the negative and positive I've shifted. You see that? So this happens throughout the material. Just throughout the material. But what, what is amazing is, look, this gets cancelled. See, they cancel out. Do you see that they all cancel out? What, what do you see on the outer faces of the insulator? What do you see? Negative here and... Okay. So this negative holds this positive and this positive holds this negative. I try to say a little bit more for the sake of those who are really trying to understand and listening, you know. But if you didn't get it, just forget that. So did you understand what dielectric polarization is or to a certain extent? That is what happens in a capacitor. And I know... Many of you are looking for formulas. For some of you, the only physics that you want is an equation, which I don't like. But I'll give it to you. Capacitance is defined as voltage by charge. Hold on. I should not have made that mistake. Charge by voltage. Capacitance is charge by voltage. Scratch it out. It's charged by voltage, okay? If you wrote the first one, please. So can you give me the unit of capacitance? 
I don't know what you said just now. What's the unit of charge? Oh, All right, I want it that way. And what is the unit of potential difference or voltage? Okay. So the unit of capacitance is, which is also called a farad. In honor of the great scientist Michael Faraday. So if I ask you what's the unit of capacitance, you can either say coulomb per volt or you can say farad. And farad is represented by the letter F. So that is what a capacitance is. So that's what I was trying to explain here. And I think I, I'm bringing it out as, I mean, I just wrote this before. Remember we had gone over this before? I just wrote that, and this is what I've been telling you right now. OK. Now, before I move over, there are many shapes for a capacitor. This is called a parallel plate capacitor. What? What do you have in this capacitor? Don't you have two parallel plates? So it's called a parallel plate capacitor. You have a cylindrical capacitor. What would that be? Two cylinders inside each other. You have a spherical capacitor. What is that? Two spheres inside each other. So when you go to the lab, today's lab is on a capacitor. Because I was trying to get you there. You know? I don't want you to be doing something that you've never heard about. So I was delaying. That's why I had the demo set up. So you're going to see a capacitor. You're not only going to see it, you're going to measure its capacitance in the lab today. It's a tough lab, but very enjoyable. When you get to the lab, you will not see two parallel plates. Didn't I say that uh, they are very close to each other? It's actually usually aluminum plates, so flimsy. Do you think you can hold them like that parallel? So you know how it is actually built? This is what is done. So you take an, uh, I'll put this back, trust me. You take an aluminum plate flat plate like that, take an insulator, take the next aluminum plate, and then roll them up. Oh, did anybody get it? I don't want to spoil this, but roll them up. So when you look at it, you won't see two paddle plates, but they're actually two paddle plates with an insulator. I'm trying to tell you something. It's rolled up, and uh, so it takes less space, and it's not flimsy, and you will see it inside a metal cover, you know, protected. So that's what you will see, but it's a parallel plate capacitor. So let me show you these capacitors. These are the various types of capacitors. And for a parallel plate capacitor, I'm going to give you another formula. This is only for a parallel plate capacitor. What's C? C for cat. No, what is C? Capacitance. What's A? The area of one of the plates. Be careful on that. The area, remember that there are two plates, and how are they? They are identical to each other. They have the same area. So in case they don't have, in case a crazy person made a capacitor like, nobody can do that. I don't know why they would do that. But let's say that they had the plates almost the same size, but they didn't keep it like that. Instead, they kept it like this. So now which area would you use? Common sense. The overlapping area. Oh, I don't have a third hand. I'm thankful I have a second one. But the overlapping area. So if you keep it like this, <coughs> what, is, what is the capacitance? No. Zero. No overlapping area. So how do you increase the capacitance? By increasing the Overlapping area. Hey, hold on. In a radio, we've done this all our lives, tuning a radio. I'm talking about manual tuning, but you don't know what you're doing. Actually, you're changing the overlapping area. We'll come to that. You're actually changing a capacitance. I'm talking about the thing that you turn. You, when you change that overlapping area, you're changing the capacitance. And then in one of the chapters, I'll tell you soon, when you change the capacitance, it picks up another radio station. So as you keep on turning, there are other radio stations that are speaking up. Is it a little bit interesting at least to know what you've been doing all your life? I'm getting different radio stations. What are you doing? Now you can tell. You know, I am changing the overlapping area. So, so I'm changing the capacitance. Therefore, I'm changing the frequency received. 
it's all going to fall into place. And it is interesting, not just to me, but to you also. That's about capacitors. All right? Any what is D? D is the distance between the plates. A is the area, overlapping area of the plates. Usually they both have the same area. But you only take the area of one of the plates, okay? K is a constant. The constant depends, it's called the dielectric constant. Huh. So it depends on what? Depends on the material that you have between the plates. So if you have mica, have you heard of mica? It has a dielectric constant of 7. So you have a capacitor. First you have nothing, only two plates. It has a certain capacitance, okay? And then what you do is you take mica and put it there. What happens to its capacitance? Goes up. How many times? Seven, Seven times. Because before you put that mica, what did you have between the two plates? Air. Air. And the dielectric constant of air is taken as one. It should make more sense as I continue. So if you have air, it's one. If you have mica, it's seven. So you got seven times bigger capacitance just by introducing that. All right, let's go to our problem set and do You recognize that I told you about polarization and that's what you see on the screen. I thought seeing pictures would uh, let you understand a little better. You see that the center of the positive charge and the center of the negative charge, they coincide. So they're exactly the same place, unpolarized. But do you see what happened here? It's kind of, you know, this is an artist's impression. It doesn't move that much, but it's polarized. So that's what I was telling you. And then here is a large-scale view of a polarized atom where the centers have actually shifted. All right. Now, I suggest that uh, you just listen instead of writing for a few minutes because we are now trying to combine capacitors. So when you combine capacitors or resistors, or you combine anything in physics, you can do it in two ways. You can put them in parallel or put them in series to each other. And this is what I'm saying. You really have to understand. If I take two capacitors and I connect them, okay? So I have capacitor A and capacitor B, and I've connected them like this. Obviously, when I connect two capacitors like this and leave it like that, it serves no purpose. Because what's the use of a capacitor? Store charges. Right now, it doesn't have any charge at all. So you've got to first charge it. How do you charge a capacitor? And again, I'm telling you, from this point on, you have to really understand. To charge a capacitor, you connect it to a battery. And how do you represent a battery? A bigger line, which always shows the positive potential, which is the positive terminal, the smaller one that shows the negative. You've got to be careful. They are completely different. You see that? Here the lines are equal. Capacitor, not equal. It's actually a cell. A combination of cells is called a battery, anyway. And then I would, I don't know, they may not draw, but I like to draw a switch, because every electrical circuit, that's what it's called, has a switch, doesn't it? You have switches in the room, don't you? So right now the switch is open, now it's closed. It's like switching on and off. I'm going to speak with a more practical point of view now because you have to do the lab today, that's why. Now to make this connection, and you, when you do this, if I name the plates A1, A2, A3, and A4, uh, I meant to say B1, B2. You can see that I've connected it that way, correct? All right, now look at the second one. It's the same two capacitors that I've connected, same two capacitors. This is A, so this is uh, A1, A2. This is B1, B2. And then, connected to a battery with a switch. Obviously, these two connections are different. 
Why? Because, now this is where you have to be really careful, you don't look at this and decide. You look at the source, the battle, and decide. You look at this. Hold on, be with me, some of you. The positive terminal is connected to A1. <coughs> and the negative terminal <coughs> is connected to what? B2. B2. And A2 and B1 are connected together. Okay. But here, the positive terminal is connected to A1 as well as B1. Oh, I still out of your brain? Okay. The positive terminal is connected to A1 as well as B1. And the negative, likewise, is connected to A2 and B2. So this is called a parallel connection. Because the voltage on A1 and B1 are the same. If the battery has a voltage of, let's say, 2 volt, 2 volt, then somebody tell me, what's the voltage here? 2. What's the voltage here? 2. two. Positive 2, to be exact. You know, positive 2, positive 2. All right. What's the uh, voltage here? Huh? Negative 2. What's the voltage here? Negative 2. Negative 2. So, aren't the voltages the same? Come on now. What is the potential difference between the plates? Two. Don't, don't worry about positive two and minus two because then you'll say four. No, don't worry about that. What's the voltage between the plates? Two. two. What's the voltage here between the plates? Two. two. So in a parallel connection, very important, in a parallel connection, the voltages are equal. <clears throat> You're going to use this, I don't know how many times. You're going to use it like 50 times. In a parallel connection, the voltages are always equal. Put this into, in your mind. As soon as you hear parallel connection, whatever it is, capacitors or resistances, you know, we're going to have so many coming on. Whenever you hear this word, immediately you recognize what? You recognize that the voltages are the same. Wait, let me also make it a little bit Please keep your questions until like five minutes because I might already answer your question. Right, let's say this is one microfarad, so that's C1, and C2 is two microfarads. I'm also trying to work out problems as I'm doing this. That's what I'm trying to do. Okay, so you have two capacitors. The capacitance of this is one microfarad, and this is two microfarad, and they're connected in parallel to a battery of voltage to what? Okay? Can you tell me how much this capacitor will be charged to? Same with this. What will be the charges if you leave them like that? How many, how much charge will they have? 